Welcome to Exploring Possibilities. I'm your host, Cheryl Sitz, a holistic spiritual speaker, coach, and the founder of Journey of Possibilities. You know, we've been doing this show since 2012. Week after week, we explore possibilities and shift perspectives in holistic spiritual ways. Never miss a show if you subscribe. You can do that on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or Google Play. And be sure to rate us, too, so others can find the show. We'll continue in just a moment. Have you ever gone to a social media seminar and you have the online experts telling you, get a blog, get a website, get on social media, all this other stuff. By the time you're done with that seminar, that online expert is very good at frying your brain. (laughs) The funny part is, you come back home, you get in front of the computer, and you're lost. Hi, I am Mario with Tech Life Balance. I see this all the time. You spend so much money and still don't know what is going on with your online presence. And you know, you probably don't need all of that. Let me go ahead and translate Geek to English for you and show you what you really need because you don't need it all. You probably only need a few components. You have a great message out there and I would like to hear it and I definitely want to help you put it out there. I am Mario Rosales with TechLifeBalance.net. I produce this podcast because I love distributing messages. Let me help you distribute your message. Who are you? Why are you here? What wonders and opportunities await you beyond physical death? What happened millennia ago to create the damaged earth and fractured societies you see around you? Empowering, enlightening, internationally acclaimed, the Joseph Communications books offer answers to these questions. Spiritual, concise, contemporary, non-denominational, the communications originate from Joseph, a highly evolved discarnate spirit concerned for you and the future of the planet and its peoples. The words of Joseph and his soul group give you the power to bring light and change into your own life and the lives of others and to restore the earth. Available in paperback, ebook, and audiobook formats, the communications can be ordered today at www.com thejosephcommunications.com and also from Amazon and other major booksellers. All proceeds are used for further publishing and advertising and to make the communications available worldwide. In the past seven years, I've been to Peru three times, worked with some of the most powerful sacred plant medicines and holistic practitioners, many of whom you've even enjoyed on this show. And this journey of possibilities has transformed me and my life. Last year, I asked myself in preparation for a book I'm writing, how could I share the very best of what I've learned to help others have powerful shifts in their lives? The answers to that helped me design a program, and now I'm inviting you to take a journey with me. Six women for six weeks to remember who you are. In this program, I empower you to stand in your divine I am love, Live your divine I know truth and use your divine I create power to create the life you really want. I am, I know, I create. Sounds simple, right? Believe it or not, these are life changing and I'll include new habits and practices that you can take into your daily life and keep evolving long after the program ends. Our first private group journey starts this fall. Are you ready? Learn more and get on the waiting list at journeyofpossibilities.com. Today's guest, Jay Staley, is a Veritas certified labyrinth facilitator and Houston's first labyrinth coach. After 25 years as an HISD school administrator, Jay's life changed when he found and began walking the labyrinth at St. Thomas University. He is a Rothko Chapel Guild founding member and now facilitates monthly labyrinth walks at historic Freedman's Town Labyrinth. Jay has facilitated construction of temporary and permanent labyrinths at Houston area churches and schools, at the Rothko Chapel's summer solstices, at core dance performances in Atlanta, Georgia, in the cloud forests of Ecuador, on the border between Ireland and Northern Ireland, and two summers in historic Lyon, France. This summer, he's helping create a labyrinth in Pissarro, Italy, in partnership with the Houston Grand Opera. All things labyrinth, welcome Jay Staley. Hey, how are you doing? Oh, I'm so good. I'm glad to have you here. Thanks for making the time to be with us today. Well, I'm happy to be here, Cheryl. You must have the patience of Job. 25 years with HISD. I went to school there. That's not an easy gig. Well, I had a 
I had a great start. It was interesting your, in your intro, you said you were in Peru. I started with the Houston Public Library and two years into that, my wife was at HISD and I got a note from my brother who was living in New Mexico that they were hiring teachers in Peru at a copper company in the south of Peru in the Andes Mountains. And I, I think I got my wife at a weak moment and we applied and they came up and talked to us and went ahead and hired us. And we spent four years, the first four years of my teaching career in the mountains uh, in Peru, in southern Peru. And we had 32 kids in a K-8 school, 10,000 feet up in the Andes Mountains. Wow. And uh, during that time, I was the I t- was hired to be the librarian. I taught kindergarten. I taught sixth grade math. I taught fourth through eighth grade reading language arts. I taught PE. I taught art and I taught music. And uh, the last year I was there, I was principal of the school. It was one of those deals where if you looked up and made eye contact in a teacher's meeting, you had another job. <laughs> So I, I had, uh, it was really a gift besides living in Peru and having that travel opportunity. I also got to really understand curriculum uh, from K, K through eight and see how schools really operate. So when I came back, I was in a position to be a librarian and an administrator. And it was a, a really great gig for me. So I had a good start. It sounds like it. Isn't it funny, those baptism by fire things where you, when you go to a, a small place like that, you really get your hands into everything and you get a good understanding of how it works. Mm-hmm. And that's exactly what happened. So it was a real gift to me. And we had started a graduate program, my wife and I both at the University of Houston, Clear Lake. And so when we left Peru, we came back to finish that graduate uh, program. I'm from the Midwest. We both graduated from Ohio State University. And we had plans to to go all over everywhere. And in the end, because we started our careers and our graduate program here in Houston, we just stayed in Houston. And my wife is still involved in the educational community here. And I'm retired from that and doing other things. Yes, you are doing other things. And I would think that during those years as a school administrator, that would have been when walking the labyrinth would have been really beneficial for building patience. But maybe you already had the patience when you discovered the labyrinth. Well, I'll tell you how I discovered the labyrinth is when I was getting ready to leave um, administration. Uh, I had gotten in early in the early 21st century. I was coming up to the to the late years of my career, and I could see on the calendar, looking ahead a few years, when it was I would be able to retire. And I got to thinking, who am I if I'm not? Jay Staley, the principal, if I were to leave the principal's building. And I, at the time, I was working in a school, and I thought it was a great school. And I thought, you know, if I'm going to be a principal for uh, the rest of my life, this is there's no reason to leave this job. But when I have the opportunity to retire, if I decide to move on to do something else, what would that be? And about that same time, I came across an article on labyrinths. And was curious. I'd never heard of them before, never never walked one, never seen one that I thought I knew about. And so I looked for the, um, I did a little research on the internet and I found the Worldwide Labyrinth Locator and I found the ones that were in the Houston area. And I realized I drove by one on a regular basis and didn't even know it was there. So I began to visit that labyrinth. It was the one on Alabama at the University of Houston, St. Thomas. It was a, a sharp replica labyrinth that's outdoors near the uh, chapel of St. Basil. And I began to visit that labyrinth on a monthly basis, sometimes two and three times a month. And I went solely to try to answer the question, who am I if I'm not a principal? And as I walked that labyrinth over the next three years, I began to realize that I I did have a life outside of the principal's office and that I needed to pursue some other things. But it was the labyrinth really that sort of um, helped me develop that new path. And uh, um, ironically, the labyrinth and all this work I do on the labyrinth was not part of my original plan. It really didn't uh, play any part whatsoever in my decision to leave uh, administration. But it has become a big part of my life now. 
That's an interesting story. And it speaks to something I hear so many people talk about when they retire. Who am I if I'm not what I've always done? Who am I if I stop doing what I've always done? And I'm curious when you say that the labyrinth helped you find those answers. To many of us who would see a labyrinth, they look very simple, very simplistic. How is something, what would you say to the question, how is something that simplistic so beneficial? Well, I think the big thing is for me, and this is probably different for other people, I probably suffer um, adult ADD. And when you're working as a school principal, that's a great thing to have because you have to multitask continually. You have to have things, lots of things on your mind. You just kind of live that life. And I was working um, be, probably between 50 and 60 hours a week for, for almost 20 years. And a, a good part of my success and my survival in that was the fact that um, I could multitask and I had lots of things going all the time. But the problem with that is it's hard to be still and it's hard to contemplate and reflect. And it's an important part of our life. And I had to really work at it when I was, um, when I was a principal. I did that usually in the car on my drive back and forth because I couldn't be moving. So I, I spent a lot of time reflecting on what was ahead and what was behind me in my work. But what the labyrinth did for me, it offered me a physical space where I could walk and think and pace myself and let go of all the other stuff and concentrate on just one thing. And I had read the possibility of that when I was doing my research about labyrinths. And I was pleasantly surprised that, in fact, that's exactly what happened when I began to walk. That's a beautiful response. And, you know, I've I've talked to a lot of people who are like, I can't meditate. And I can totally relate to that because I am hummingbird energy. I'm like, bzz, bzz, gotta go, 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 do, do, do. Yeah, and I can really do that. <laughs> good multitasker, all the things you were saying. So sitting down and just completely being still and meditating can be a radical shift for a lot of people like me. And I think things like the labyrinth are wonderful tools to help us kind of move into that quieter space, like a transition tool, if you will, or a way to kind of step out of one world and into another, or how would you describe it? Well, I would say the same thing. I had a difficult time. I tried yoga. I tried meditation, sitting meditation, and I just had a difficult time. I wasn't comfortable physically. Uh, I, I if I got if I if I stayed still and got too relaxed, I was tired and I fell asleep instead of get, getting into a mode of meditation. And what I found with uh, the labyrinth is because physically I was moving. But I didn't have to think about where I was moving because you just put one foot in front of the other and you don't get lost and you don't have to consider, am I turning the right direction? That you kind of um, walk yourself into a meditative state. And that's what happened. And that's what I would encourage people like you and I who have uh, energy. I don't want to say energy issues, who have bountiful energy, that there are ways that you can slow yourself down without stopping. And uh, using that process to um, go into a deeper uh, thinking and meditating process time. Yeah, absolutely. Or to stop thinking for once in our busy lives, right? That's true. And, And I did have a problem with that. And I did work on that some. Just try not to think about anything. And I, I, I can do that. And I do do that on the labyrinth when I just feel overwhelmed. But what I have found, too, is that it allows me to um, compartmentalize much better, to move things off the, the, the front burner, to move things out of sight and just concentrate on one thing at a time, which typically I, I struggle with. Yeah, I can relate. I think they're a great leadership tool for that reason. And, and I've played games kind of with it where maybe sometimes I'm in a place where I need to let some things go. And so... As I move through the labyrinth, I'm consciously releasing things that I don't need to be carrying anymore. And then when I come back from the center out to the outside, I'm putting in things that would better better serve me. I don't know. Is you're a facilitator? Are those the kinds of activities that you facilitate, or do you? What does that look like to actually guide somebody? Well, we always talk about this sort of the the labyrinth in the labyrinth community. <laughs> 
how we look at labyrinth walks. And we always talk, I always mention the three R's, the um, releasing, receiving, and returning. So as we walk, I always am talking to people about as you, as you go from the outside on the path to the center, um, you try to release the stressors, release the burdens, release the extra stuff you carry typically. Um, let go of as much as you can. Concentrate on your breath and on your breathing breathing, or on the rhythm of your steps. And when you get to the center of the labyrinth, take time. Uh, and that's a hard thing for people to do. That's, that's when people do have to stop and stay sort of in one place. Most labyrinths have a center enough. You can have a routine within the center where you don't have to be really still. But a lot of the people I walk with We'll sit down cross-legged in the center or even lay down in the center of the labyrinth. I usually move um, to different parts of the center. But at any rate, in the center, you take the time to receive the wisdom that the labyrinth has to give you that particular day, that particular walk. And then you hold on to that wisdom as you leave the labyrinth and take the path out. And you return back into the world with that um with the wisdom that you've discovered. And kind of like what you said, as you think about that, you can think about the ways that you're going to apply that in your life to try to hold on to some of the the deeper stillness that um, you gather when you're walking the labyrinth and try to take that out into the world with you. In Houston, the moment you get into a car and get into traffic, (laughs) it's hard to hold on to that. But um, I encourage people to give it a try. Yeah, it sure is. Traffic seems to be the one place where we all learn patience or not in in the Houston area. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so tell us a little about what you've learned about how these began as spiritual places or spiritual tools or how they how you would language that. Well, historically, if you look at the labyrinth, you can go back um 2 or 3,000 years to different cultures. It seems to be an archetype that is uh, shows up in cultures all over the globe, whether you're in Indonesia or India or the uh, Mediterranean or um, Europe. We find labyrinths or labyrinth designs in all those places in Native American cultures. So literally around the world, you'll find the sort of the embrace of that archetype. I'm a, a professional storyteller and spent a long time in the storytelling community. And we talk a lot about those same um frameworks or archetypes in story that show up in in cultures all over the world this the cinderella story is told there's probably 200 variants of it and i think it's a story that is so a part of the human experience that it's not a story that's been passed from culture to culture it's a story that comes organically out of each culture and each culture has a version of it so i i see the same thing with some of these Um, designs, visual designs like the spiral and the labyrinth, that these are designs that speak to the essence of what it is to be a human being and walk in the world, whether this is a symbol of the womb or the sacred circle, um, the earth itself, the roundness of the circle of life or any of those um, circles that we look at in in the process of our life. And so um, and it's interesting from a storytelling standpoint, you see those same circles come around there too. the sort of the hero's journey. Some of these story archetypes have that same circular pattern. So I, I think it's part of who we are as human beings. So you, we've seen these things in cultures dating back long before the time of Christ. And I guess in Western culture, you begin to see them emerge more in the Mediterranean during the period of the Greek um, the, the Greek and Roman realms. In early Rome, they use um, round and square labyrinth designs in their architecture, whether it was carved into walls or laid into the, um, the tiles and floors. I'm not exactly sure when people begin to walk it, though. Uh, you see it carved in stone going a long ways back, but in terms of having it large and on the ground, it seems to have evolved into that during the Middle Ages. The Catholic Church adopted um, the labyrinth, uh, placed it in the floors of a lot of the cathedrals that were built built in the Middle Ages in 1200 period era. 
and they were um, they're mostly appeared in the churches that were built to the Virgin Mary. And I wonder if there's some um, connection there to the womb or the circle of life. But um, there were a number of cathedrals and churches in uh, France and Germany and England where the labyrinth appeared. At the same time, there were labyrinths appearing in Scandinavia, and they were used by fishermen as kind of a jumping off place from earth to water. So fishermen would walk the labyrinth before they went out on the sea in their boats. And then when they came back, they would walk the labyrinth again um, in gratitude to the earth for allowing them to have either success in their fishing or a safe return to land. So it's it's an interesting um, historical process and kind of mysterious as well. A lot of the things that uh, the early labyrinths, we don't know a lot about them. We just know they were there. That is so interesting. I'd never heard that about the fishermen and stuff. That is so intriguing. That- There's still a, a huge number of labyrinths that can be uh, found in Scandinavia and Sweden and uh, Norway. Uh, one of my friends, Lars, he lives out in California, but he does tours to Sweden and Scandinavia, and they go uh, in search of these labyrinths. There's one island uh, off the coast of Sweden that has about 17 labyrinths on it. Wow. That's incredible. <laughs> yeah, it is incredible. It is an amazing thing. I bet you had no idea. I mean, I had no idea when I knew we were going to talk about labyrinths today, where all this conversation could go. You must have found like you found this other world when you started tapping into this vast realm of labyrinths. Well, I, it has been a fascinating journey for me. I, I started with just walking labyrinths and knowing that uh, labyrinths were so, was so, the process was something that helped me. It helped me focus and it helped me think. And at the same time, right after I retired from the principal's office, I started working, doing some consulting work through uh, the Region 13 Education Service Center in Austin. And they offered a, a leadership coaching school so that I, uh, the people that took the, the, went to the school could get trained in how to use coaching skills in helping school leaders that we were working with. And one of the trainers that trained me, it was a, a Mary Manti, a coach from the Upper Peninsula in Michigan. She'd come down to, to Austin to help train this group, this cohort of coaches. And I was just visiting with her one day. She's, a, she's an amazing human being and, and a great friend, became a great friend. And I was visiting with her one day and I was sharing with her my excitement over labyrinths because I was sort of discovering this on the side. I was beginning to talk about it with people. And I asked Mary, did she know anything about labyrinths? And she smiled at me and she said, I have a labyrinth in my backyard. No way. (laughs) Yeah. So I began to talk to her about it and she knew about labyrinths and she understood the power of the personal power. And she and her husband had used stone and built a labyrinth in their backyard at their cabin in the Upper Peninsula in Michigan. And she walked this labyrinth. Well, Uh, The next time I think we met, she came to me and she said she was thinking about going to a a training to learn more about labyrinths and how we could use labyrinths. And the training was in Ohio. Well, it ended up the training was not too far from where I grew up. And I felt like I could accomplish three things if I went to that training. Number one, I'd learn more about labyrinths. Number two, I'd be able to spend a weekend with Mary Manti, which had to be a a gift in and of itself. And thirdly, I would be able to visit my family uh, because it was only about an hour. My family home was only about an hour from where we were being trained. So I signed up and I met Mary and there were about 25 or 30 of us from all over the country. And it was presented by Veritas and and Lauren Artris was the facilitator. And she is sort of the the earth mother of lab of the labyrinth renaissance, I guess. She's the one that went back to Chart looking for the original labyrinth in the floor of Chart Cathedral and asked people at the cathedral about it, and they weren't even sure what she was talking about. But she found it under the chairs, and she asked if she could move the chairs, and people were not sure what she was talking about. And eventually, <sighs> she and her friends just moved all the chairs and wow. started walking the labyrinth. And she was a, she is a retired Episcopal priest from San Francisco. And at the time, she was working as a priest and she was burning out and she was having a lot of problems with her faith journey. 
and lots of doubts about God. And she knew she had to do something. And Labyrinths ended up being the something that she did. And since then, she's retired from the ministry and she started Veritas, this organization that promotes labyrinths and, and offers training for people that are interested. And that's where Mary and I ended up in a, in a Veritas training session, a wellness center at a farm in Tip City. And the, the other interesting thing about that weekend was the co-facilitator was a labyrinth facilitator from uh, Galveston, Texas. <laughs> So there were all these connections being made. This is another thing I think the magic of the of these communities that we work in is that these amazing connections that we make. So I came back from that and I was uh, at that point, having gone through the training, I was a trained facilitator. But to be a certified facilitator, you have to offer community walks and you have to do some reflection on those walks and take some pictures and talk about a little bit with people about what it meant to you and what you were going to do with this. And I had a year to do that. And I thought, well, I might as well do that. I've already paid for it. All I have to do is do the work now. So I began to provide some walks and think about what it was I was doing. And in the end, uh, after a year, I, I sent my paperwork in and I became a, a a certified facilitator with Veritas. And that opened up another door. So I can go to that space if you want me to, as, as far as how I began to build labyrinths. Yeah, that was my next question is, is this thing just kind of seemed to snowball and take on an essence all its own? Now you not only walk them and guide them, but you build them. So where did that come from? Well, at the same time that I was, the, another one of my paths out of the principal's office and into <laughs> and into a new life, I became a guide, a guild member of the Rothko Chapel. And the Rothko Chapel is this absolutely incredible uh, spiritual sacred space that the city of Houston is blessed with because of the work of the Damon Neal family. And they were looking to create a volunteer organization that would help their staff at the Rothko Chapel. And I volunteered to do that and was accepted and got trained to do that. And so I was serving as a, as a host and as a guild member uh, within the Rothko Chapel. Every month they provide an opportunity for, for anyone in the community to come into the Rothko Chapel and hear about some meditative practice that's going on in the world. And a lot of them are faith practices, but they're not all faith practices. But I've been there and heard about uh, Muslim and Sufi meditation and Hindu meditation and Buddhist meditation and Christian meditation and aerobic meditation, lots of different uh, meditative practices. Once a month, they have an event like this. And I was there working one, one month at this uh, meditative practice. And one of the staff members at Rothko said to me, Jay, I got to introduce you to somebody. There's somebody here I want to introduce you to. And the person was Mike Pardee. And Mike Pardee was working at the Boniac Institute at Rice University, which is the Institute for the uh, Development and Understanding of Religious Tolerance. And Mike was doing an outreach program with high school students. And each year they would go and visit sacred spaces all around the city of Houston. They go to the Baha'i Center and the Quaker Center and they go to a mosque and the Sikh um, Gudwara and lots of different um, sacred spaces in the Houston area with these high school kids just to introduce them to this idea that in a city like Houston, with such a diverse population, there are many, many different sacred paths that people walk. Mm -hmm. and. At the end of this, this journey that these kids go on each year, they had been doing some kind of piece of public art that reflected what they learned in this journey. And they had been doing large murals at nonprofit organizations through the help of a Reginald Adams, who is a local public artist. And Mike, for some reason, decided he thought it might be fun for the kids to build a labyrinth. He didn't know anything about how to do it. He wasn't even sure what he was thinking about, but he just had this idea. So when Ashley Clemmer 
introduced Mike and I, and Mike said, do you know anything about labyrinths? And I said, I began to talk to him. I was very excited. Oh yeah, I'm doing this and I'm thinking about this and I think it's great. And we got, had this animated conversation out in the plaza outside of Roscoe Chapel. And by the time the conversation was over, he had decided that he needed to hire me to be their labyrinth coach <laughs> and, to and to help these kids build a labyrinth. Well, I didn't even know there was such a thing as a labyrinth coach. But he asked me if I was willing to be one, and I told him I'd love to. And what happened then was I met these kids and spent nine months with them. And in the process of that, we began to look at labyrinth designs and the whole idea about how one would take a design and put it down on the ground and build something that was a lasting gift to the community. That was Mike's plan. That was Mike's vision. So my vision had to be how to make that happen in terms of building a labyrinth. So I began to make contacts with people that had done it. There's a, a labyrinth at the Covenant Church in Houston. And uh, I talked to the guy that built that at the at, as part of a millennial project at his church. And we kind of used his notes and his drawings as our guidebook to to try to design and build a labyrinth. And at the same time, Reginald Adams, who was the mural um, artist, was working with us. And he knew a group of people in the fourth ward who had approached him about a space in the fourth ward that had once held one of the African-American churches, the uh, Mount Carmel Missionary Baptist Church, which was uh, leveled in 2006. And the community didn't, the congregation didn't have enough money to rebuild it. It was in disrepair. And so it was just piles of bricks piled along the side of this big lot in the fourth ward. And they came upon this idea that maybe this group of ragtag high school kids with these travelers or these guides that weren't real sure what they were, were doing, had never done anything like it before, should build their labyrinth at that space. And so in the end, we spent about six weeks with these high school kids and a bunch of volunteers, and we moved um, six truckloads of sand and 52 tons of crushed granite, and we took the bricks that were left over from the church to put down the paths of the labyrinth and filled it with the crushed granite. And in the end, in June of 2014, we had created a 50-foot diameter shark style labyrinth that sits now in this lot where the Mount Carmel Missionary Baptist Church once stood. And the path of the labyrinth is actually the bricks of the church. And it's lovely because when you go to that lot, the, the steps of the church are still there, and you can walk up those steps and look out over onto the labyrinth. Uh, and it's kind of a threshold entry space into the into the labyrinth and when that project was over we dedicated it in june and when that project was over i made a commitment that i was going to do some kind of labyrinth related activity there for at least once a month for a year so that some of the energy that went into that um, project that was so amazing we might be able to hold on to and we've been doing those once a month walks there now for almost three years and we're still holding on to some of that energy it's really nice what a beautiful story and you've gone on to build them like i said at the beginning of the show all over the place all over the world and you build them out of temporary permanent out of all kinds of materials how how does this come about does somebody just contact you and say hey i want a labyrinth well it's sometimes we contact people and say that looks like a nice place for a labyrinth <laughs> but it's at the point now where people know that we're labyrinth builders and that we like to do it. And so people come to us and I can tell you about some of that process. I will tell you, we've never, ever built one since that has been as complicated or time consuming as the first one we built. Now, I don't know whether we learned our lesson <laughs> or what happened with that. That labyrinth in Freedmanstown was a lot of work and a lot of time and took a lot of manpower. And what we discovered really quickly was to have that happen is is quite difficult. And to generate the kind of energy that we had generated around that is quite difficult. 
Mm-hmm. So we began to try to figure out how to do it easier. And I'll tell you a couple of the ways we do, do that. The next one we built was, again, with the, the SSQ, Sacred Sites Quest kids from Rice University. We painted a labyrinth onto a courtyard at the High School for International Studies in Sharpstown, Sharpstown High School for International Studies. Worked with a group of high school students out there. And that was the first labyrinth we built that was not a sing. Well, it was a single path with dual exits. It's a a processional labyrinth, they call it. So you walk in one side into the middle. And when you leave the labyrinth, you walk out another way and out the other side. Because this courtyard was a courtyard that kids seemed to pass through on their way from one place to another on the school grounds, we built the labyrinth. So as they passed through that center of the courtyard, they could walk the labyrinth and go out the other side. So that was the first one that we painted onto a pathway. And we've since done that several times. I painted a labyrinth, a man in the maze labyrinth, which is a Native American design from Southern Arizona, Pima Indians from Southern Arizona. Uh, We painted that design. We were going to work that one. We were going to build that one in South America and Ecuador. And we wanted to try it out first. So we painted it onto a round concrete space at the Rye School of Houston because I happened to know the director there and she said um, she'd be happy to have us come and paint that labyrinth on if we wanted to use her space as a canvas for our work. So we took the kids over there and did that. We also painted, Reginald and I painted a labyrinth called a um, problem-solving labyrinth on a elementary school campus in Friendswood. And the way that one works is it's a dual path labyrinth as well. And it's designed, all these labyrinths are designed for reflection and contemplation. But this particular labyrinth, this problem solving labyrinth, is one that is designed for two people to walk together. And you go to this labyrinth with a, with a, a problem between two people that needs to be solved. And they enter the labyrinth at the same time, but the pathways are mirror image. So one is walking on one side of the labyrinth and the other is walking on the other. And the design is that you stop along the way and face each other and confront your problem. So the first thing, the first stop in the walk is you stop and you turn and you tell the other person what you think the problem is. And you listen to the other person tell what, tell you what they think the problem is. And then you walk the labyrinth a little bit more and you come back and you talk to each other about how that makes you feel. So you spend some time discussing how this problem between the two of you has made you feel. And each of them, each person states whether it makes them angry or whether it makes them sad or whatever it is, however this problem comes up in terms of their feelings. The third time that you stop It's your job to repeat back what the other person has said about what they think the problem is and how it makes them feel. So it's kind of a check to see if you've been listening fully. Mm -hmm. The fourth time that you stop and you face each other, you start listing, brainstorming all the different ways that you can think of that you might solve this problem. So if you can think of five solutions or 10 solutions, and some of them might be pretty abrupt, like we could just not be friends anymore, and then that would, that would solve the problem. So it's kind of open. You can, you can bring out whatever solutions that you think might work to solve this problem. And the final step, you're face-to-face in the center of this labyrinth with a line in between you at your feet, and your job is to try to agree upon a solution that will move you in the right direction. And if you agree upon a solution that moves you in the right direction, Reginald and and I designed this labyrinth where you could walk out then of the labyrinth side by side. If you don't agree, come to an agreement, you can turn around and retrace your steps and go out the labyrinth in opposite directions. So it's a very interesting process. But that one is another the one that we painted onto the uh, ground. We also did some indoor painting on some gymnasiums, church gymnasiums, and ended up actually buying a machine that helps us tape down uh, the lines and, and paint. 
I imagine I'm I'm still back at the problem solving labyrinth. I'm in lo- as somebody that has spent a lot of years studying communication and conflict resolution. I'm a family mediator. Um, I've I've mediated divorces in Montgomery County, which is required by the courts here before you can be divorced. Uh, I've done all kinds of work with this, and that is just a very powerful sounding tool. And the steps that you incorporated in there are str- our textbook for how to the solve text a problem for mediation. Yeah, 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 they are. I've had other I've had other lawyers talk to me about um, building a problem solving labyrinth that they could use with their clients because yeah. it's it's textbook mediation. And again, it does what we talked about earlier is if you're sitting at a table um, across from each other with this wooden space in between, there is sort of a confrontational as much as you want to try. There's a sense of confrontation. But if you're walking and you're walking as you and stopping and talking and walking and stopping and talking, it takes on a different feel. Yes. So I think there's tremendous power in it. And uh, I'll send you the information I have about the, that labyrinth and how it works. Yay. And you can sh- you can share it with your listeners if you like. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Well, and so, also the walking diffuses some of that. So so our emotions are bringing through all this energy in our body as we're kind of getting worked up about the things that upset us and whatever. And so that built-in walking is brilliant for moving that energy and moving through those feelings. Yeah, I really do believe there's tremendous power in it. And I have I don't think it's used to the level that it could be used. So I'm I'm very excited when somebody else is excited about it, sees the power. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, you've gone on to build them all over the world. You're about to go. Tell us about your your upcoming project this summer. Two, three years ago, we went to Lyon with these high school kids, and we went to Chartres, and we saw the 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 labyrinth and the floor of the cathedral in Chartres, and we walked a labyrinth in Chartres, and we went up to Amiens, and we saw one of the old labyrinths in the cathedral in Amiens, which was uh, covered with chairs, <laughs> and they have no a schedule where they take the chairs off and let people walk oh. the labyrinth. This is in 2014. It was kind of unbelievable. Wow. They, they didn't even know. I felt they didn't even know the power of what they had, but mm-hmm. the church, uh, that's a whole nother program, but the church is, <laughs> is sometimes afraid of the labyrinth. Yeah. <laughs> but at any rate, we, we built a labyrinth uh, on the Fovier up above the city of Lyon. Uh, it, was, it was a beautiful experience, and the kids had a great time. So we decided we needed to do it again. So the following year, we had a lot of help from the Schlumberger Company, oil and gas production units. Schlumberger does a lot of oil and gas production stuff. Uh, I guess field services support stuff. And they were giving us money to, to um, take these kids on these journeys. And we were actually working with high school kids in other parts of the world where Schlumberger had services provided and they were working with some high school kids, educational programming, and they just put us into those programs. So we worked with um, some high school kids and our kids got to meet up. At any rate, in Ecuador, we found a, uh, a retreat center that was built on the equator and we built a labyrinth on the equator or about 50 yards off of the equator, but it was quite an experience for those kids. We had river rocks delivered before we got there. And then we, we mapped out the design and had the kids put the river rocks down on the design. And it was a man in the maze labyrinth and it was a beautiful experience. And we came back thinking we need to do this again. And Slumberjay was going through some budget issues and, and, they, we didn't have the funding that we had hoped we could continue with them. And we were grateful that we had the funding for as long as we had it, but we had to go look elsewhere. And we became a partner with the Houston Grand Opera. They have a program, they, an initiative they have right now, they're calling Seeking the Human Spirit. And they're partnering with community members, but they're providing at least two operas a year that are somehow under this theme, this large umbrella theme of Seeking the Human Spirit. This particular year, the theme is sacrifice, and the the uh, operas are sort of arranged around that theme of sacrifice. And they ask us to be their partners. And 
part of that partnership is we're taking our high school kids to the opera and we're doing some some labyrinth work here in Houston. And then this summer, we're going to take our kids to to Italy and we're going to go to Rome and Florence and Milan. But we're also going to uh, spend three or four days in the little town of Fesso, which is uh, Rossini's hometown, the uh, the uh, the composer, the opera composer Rossini, and and we're going to build several labyrinths, one on the beach that's a temporary labyrinth and one that's a permanent labyrinth. And we're going to actually perform some uh, work in English and Italian on the labyrinths once we get them built. So we're very excited about that trip. Yeah, I can only imagine. <laughs> 20 kids, about 20 high school kids from about 10 or 11 different high schools in the Houston area, uh, ranging in age from high school freshmen to high school seniors. And they're great kids. It's a very diverse group of kids, both religious diver- diversity and um, ethnic diversity. And it's so much fun when we get them all together and and come together around this idea of creation, creating, and this idea of seeking the human spirit and doing it around labyrinth design and, and walking the labyrinth. You're creating something they're going to remember for the rest of their lives together. So I think they, that's they, fabulous. It really is. And that's one of the things Reginald and I had a conversation about is when you work with kids, if you show them or tell them something, they might remember it. But if you do something with them, they do remember it the rest of their lives. It becomes something that's unforgettable. And that's what we're trying to create. That's me. You hear the sirens? Oh, yeah. Loud and clear. I remember Houston. I remember living in Houston. Lots of sirens, lots of traffic noise. I live downtown by the um, city jail. So oh, <laughs> you get plenty of it. A pretty busy place. Yeah. Well, thank, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. We're, we're already running out of time for the show, but I do like to ask my guests as we wrap up, if there's a parting thought you'd like to leave us with and along our theme of labyrinths, what would you really like for us to know about the power of labyrinths? Well, I think the the wonder, wonderful thing about the labyrinth is everybody finds their own power in it. There's no right or way, wrong way to walk a labyrinth. There's no correct speed or 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 numbers or anything. You can walk them with people in community. You can walk them alone. You can take whatever problem or issue or concern or question that you have to the labyrinth and use the power of that labyrinth to help you wrestle with that. And I think it's a tremendous tool that we need in the, the sort of the fast paced world that we live in and the, and the divided and problematic world that we live in. I think there's so much that it, that so many ways the labyrinth can be used to help us. There are labyrinths that you can find in your community. You look on the internet, worldwide labyrinth, the locator dot org. I think it might be dot com, but. Uh, you look and and you type in your zip code or your town, and it will tell you any labyrinth near to where you are. So uh, we're blessed in Houston that we have 30 or 40 labyrinths in Houston now. But there are ways that, that um, you can find a labyrinth. If you're creative, you can build one in your front yard with a lawnmower. I did that recently with a friend <laughs> who wanted to gather her neighbors who made it through um, Harvey. And they, she said, we need something like that in our neighborhood. And she said, can you put it in my front yard? So I went out one morning with my lawnmower and uh, her husband and I mowed a labyrinth into her front yard. And the other day I got a video of her husband mowing it after months and they're still mowing it and still walking it. That is so awesome. It's not a hard thing to do. Um, and I would encourage uh, your audience to look into the possibilities of how it might help them in their own spiritual journeys. Jay, thank you so much for everything you've shared with us. And we'll have your email on the podcast. So if anybody needs to contact you, they can reach you that way, right? That would be great. I'd love to talk to them. And that's Jay Staley in A Look at Labyrinths. How'd you like the show? Let me know and be sure to check out our mailing list. Get on that so you'll hear about upcoming guests, events, everything that we've got going on. You can do all of that at journeyofpossibilities.com. I will see you next time on Exploring Possibilities.